Hello and welcome to Cocktails with Me and a terrific friend of mine, Minya Ben Sassen, the new artistic director of my alma mater, Hartford Stage in Hartford, Connecticut. Welcome, Minya. Thank you, Mark. Now, Your martini looks so good. I just <laughs> want to say that. I, I I just not seeing something as glamorous in your hand. I, I know. I'm sorry. We're getting ready for our virtual gala. So we're doing some recording at your home theater because this is still, I feel your presence very much in this theater, Mark. So wow. I just want to say how how honored I am to be carrying the legacy of, of you and Michael and Darko. I mean, it's it's really, it's a stage with a lot of memories. Well, we've, we the the three of us the guys you just mentioned were thrilled with your your choice and the the fact that you wanted to leave the theater when you did i just thought it was we all thought it was just great it was the perfect yeah. next step so i'm glad you're there i i um you know folks who are here tonight should know that Amelia and i first met thousands of years ago thousands at the hartford stage do you want to talk about that briefly sure so i um had the great honor of being a drama league director and that's an extraordinary program in new york city to foster and develop early career directors and it was um thanks to that appointment that i was made assistant director to emily mann who was directing a certain mark lamos as Dr. Ronk in a production of Doll's House here at Hartford Stage in, do I name the year, Mark? If you can remember it, yeah. I can, I can because it was my drama league year. So okay. it was fall of 86, it's 1986. And um, and I just, it was such a thrill. It was you and Davis Trotheran and Mary McDonald. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was It was a wonderful cast. I and felt Janet Zarish, oh my God. It was Janet just Zarish, a great group. Oh God, she yeah. was so She was amazing, yeah. And I Emily have, directing. So when, when I think about it, I I never. I'm not saying this to be modest, but I never felt like I was up to the level of the rest of that company. They were just so exciting to be on stage with. And you know, um, my my I memories for the part a little bit. I felt it should have been sort of what the age I am now. You know. You know, I loved that it was younger. And in fact, when I did Doll's House a few years ago at the Huntington your performance was very much in my mind. I thought the the fact that he's dying as a young man with this unrequited love, I, I thought the youth just served to sort of tell the the story of these wasted lives. In a yeah, way. Emily finally convinced me that that yeah, was, it was great. Work, but it was really, it was really a beautiful production. Wow. Yeah, it was a good production. I it it was, was and that was my first uh, professional uh, assignment, really. It was my first experience of a regional theater, too, right? Which is, I mean, I was a kid. I was almost straight out of school, so. That's why it's so great to see you there now. Isn't it a, a, <laughs> just weird? I mean, it's, I, I have, I've shared this story with folks of how you really don't know how the pieces, how the, the different chords in your life are going to be wound together. Do you know the strands? Um, a bit of a cliche, I know, but still it it is amazing. You don't know which piece of your life is going to come back writ large. And th there is a, a just a, a certain blind faith that if you keep going, things will make sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's very so this true. all makes strange sense to me. Well, you know, a minute ago you brought up two words, one of which was virtual, which seems to be the world so many of us are living in like this. Yep. Um, I I wanted to. I mean, we've all we're all experiencing it. All the performing arts are experiencing this amazing coming to the end of our amazing year of lockdown and quarantine and fears and loss of friends and all of that. But for you, I feel it was a particularly challenging time because you were just about to launch your first season there, right? That's right. Um, the the part that well, there's so many parts that have been hard. Um, I will say that now that it's almost a year, I'm starting to feel like there is light at the end of the tunnel and that it's not an oncoming train. I'm I'm not sure, <laughs> but it's starting to feel like things are going to come back. Um, it is extraordinarily difficult to not to have started this way and um, to not be known as a stage director by my audiences. 
the last time I directed at Hartford Stage was when Michael was artistic director and I did a play, a, a wonderful play of Eddie Sanchez's called Diosa. But that was many moons ago as well. And so to not have gotten to direct as artistic director yet, that was really a loss. We, we closed down a few weeks before I would have gone into rehearsals. So I, I did feel that as a, what is my identity leading this institution when I'm not known for what I think is one of the main reasons I'm here? Not the, now, luckily, not the only reason I'm here, yeah. right? So the, the, the sense of not being known as a theater director over this year has not been made up for, but has shifted to my being known more in the community, all virtually. But I mean, I have gotten to know some board members really well just through Zoom meetings. And the outpouring of support for Hartford Stage from this community, you know, because I have, since you did make your home here for so many years, this is an extraordinarily generous and committed community to this theater. Yeah. So um, I've I've gotten to know folks through this medium and through my my version of cocktails with Mark, right? Which is yeah. which you were generous enough to appear on <laughs> one of my first what we call seen and heard live, and those started you know the week we the week after we shut the theater. Yeah. So I've gotten to know folks through this medium of conversation. But How often do you do those, Amelia? So the first part of the pandemic from March until June, I think even part of July, we did them weekly. And that was too much. I mean, I, I was suddenly, I was really feeling like a talk show host, not a theater, not a theater maker in any way. And that was too much. So we do them monthly now. Our mm -hmm. next one is March 27th. So I invite you all to Seen and Heard Live. HartfordStage.org yes. uh, has all the info. But um, but it has been a wonderful way, as you've discovered, or as you know, as 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 you see in your practice, that it's a good way to remind ourselves that we have communities, and yeah. for our communities to remember that we're here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, no question. I also, you know, hearing you talk about how how it was too much to do it, you know, uh, every week. Uh, one of my colleagues at the theater, uh, our, our associate producer and I were having our usual morning talk yeah. this morning, um, catching up on stuff. And and we both remarked for the millionth time, isn't it amazing how long it takes to get anything done? You know, you can't I, walk into a rehearsal room and start to just make decisions about things or have people tell you certain things that just will will organize the day. It's so weird. And I feel like this is at least something we share with everyone in every industry that we've, that the isolation and the cost of needing to schedule meetings and be on computers and, and not be able to breathe air together quite literally. It, it, it has added so much stress and so many working hours to everybody's life. Mm -hmm. Right. I've had a couple of people say, and I'm sure you have too, wait, but you're not producing theater. So why are you working 18 hour days? <laughs> and I, I don't know. <laughs> I just know I'm the scenario planning, the thinking um, hardest. One of the hardest things uh, of this year for Hartford stage was letting go of an extraordinary staff. And so that trying to figure out how, how and when we reopen and when we can hire folks back and hire new friends to join us in this enterprise. That's crucial right now, but that was hard, right? I spent my first few months getting to know people and then within, what was it? Eight months of, of meeting folks, I was laying them off. Yes, one of the worst days of my life. And, and certainly one of the worst days of their lives too. Absolutely. Uh, what I will say, I'm sure this was true of your folks, is people were amazingly understanding and generous about the news, understanding what circumstances were driving us to do these things. I, I, I just wanna say to all of you out there, theater workers, if you're watching us as well, I mean, thank you for your generosity because people have really, stepped up they've been so elegant about yeah. continuing to support these institutions even as these institutions have not been able to support them the way they used to well then there's a memory of what 
people loved when they were able to walk inside the Hartford stage or the Westport Country right. Playhouse and be with us and watch right. and be together. You know, I think right. that's the thing. That's no, I think that's right. I almost miss being an audience member more than I miss uh, watching theater. You know, the yeah. actual. Thing you know, I miss a rehearsal room. Oh, just yeah. I don't. Again, I miss seeing theater, and I just miss rehearsal rooms. I walked into our rehearsal room down the hall um, uh, yesterday as we're getting ready for some gala filming, and I, I it broke my heart to just be in that space. I, I didn't even realize how much I was missing just being in these rooms, these rehearsal rooms full of history and the 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 sense of people working and caring and and exposing their inner selves and sharing stories so and, yeah. and channeling other voices oh it was just i can't wait to get back to that, that i can't either that, that that's the thing i love the most about working in the theater and it's certainly the thing i love the most about being an artistic director because i can i can help foster other directors yeah I love and you're it. so good at that mark i mean oh. you are you are you are I but mean, it's something i really love you know it's it's when you're freelancing you don't really see how other people work. Right. And one of the wonderful things about what you and I do is that we get to not only offer artists gigs and jobs and- But and learn from them. them. But help them, yeah. I mean, be there for them, produce them, you know, and it then is. Have to watch them work. And, you know, I all the years I've been doing this, it's just amazing how different every director is. Don't you mm -hmm. find? I mean, totally. And I, I can't wait to get, you know, more of a chance to do that, to host people. Years ago, someone said to me, you have to know, and I, I think this is a quote of Samuel Johnson, though don't hold me to it, I'm not sure, but that you have to know whether in your very self, you're a guest or a host. <laughs> and I thought that was wonderful. Yeah. And, and I think you're right, some of us are hosts, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I have that same, I can't wait to bring more people into this building, you know? artists, community leaders, different kinds of patrons, you know, to really make our theater be something that you can't imagine this city being without, right? Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that is how we feel about these places and we want everyone to feel that way. What was the production you were planning that had to not happen? So the production that I was planning, which I'm still hoping we will reopen with, uh, that's the plan at the moment, is a production of Ah Wilderness. So it's Eugene O'Neill's only comedy. And it's been it's never been done at Hartford Stage, even though O'Neill was a Connecticut boy. And what I love about it is its sense, it's it's a it's a work of imagination for O'Neill. It's not a work of biography. He's taking all very familiar characters that we'd recognize from his biographical works, autobiographical works, and uh, and gives them all more hope and more chances for redemption. And so in the end, it, it is a happy play. And uh, I had a wonderful cast, many of whom I hope will return to Hartford when we can, uh, yeah, of, of really telling the story through the lens of what families look like now, of, of a, a BIPOC and a Caucasian family of, of artists of different ages and different ethnic backgrounds working together, making this, you know, this ideal family. That that what do families look like now, and what do ideal families feel like, as much as what they look like, right? This is always, and I I really love taking these plays uh, by Ibsen, by O'Neill, by Chekhov. Uh, and saying they're not white plays. We view them as white plays, whatever, and we can talk about what that means or not, but I just love wrestling that play and putting in the great range of American acting talent that exists in this moment in this country. So we're gonna do that, I hope, with live music and um, just really celebrate what it means to have community. It sounds like the kind of production that would really put your stamp on the That's, aesthetic of the theater. Right. And and that was part of it, is you want to say, you know, I mean, each of you, uh, you and Michael and uh, Darko, certainly, you know, you're remembered for 
for a style, for either playwrights or productions. I mean, Mark, I think about your Pier Gint. I mean, I don't know what year that Pier Gint was, but I came up to Hartford just to see that Pier Gint and all two, right? And Richard Thomas as Pier Gint. It was stunning. It was Thank truly you. one of the best things I've ever seen. So, but anyway, you hope. I hope I have years to put my stamp on this theater as well, as well as inviting a lot of other artists to contribute to the I do, I do too. Oh, I, I think, hope so, I hope so. You know, the longevity of the artistic director, I think is is a very important thing in a, in a, in a profession where there's so much fluidity between jobs right. and everybody is, you know, looking well, for- You the wanna build a conversation, right? I mean, yeah. you really wanna build a conversation with your audience. And with the national scene of here's the kind of work Hartford Stage really wants to do now. And Absolutely right. You know when I when I was um, uh, meeting with people on the search committee from Westport after you know 14 or so years of freelancing. Right. Um, the the main question was why do you want to do this? You have a successful freelancing career and right. operating theater and whatnot. And I said I just miss having a conversation with an audience. It's exactly right. I remember yeah. bumping into you on a train. Do you remember like your last year, yeah. I was visiting relatives of my husband's in Connecticut and I was going back to the city for rehearsal or something. And and you and I got to ride into the city together right. and you were right at, you were just at the beginning of freelancing. Of, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so I, I love what you've done career wise and I think, you know, it's very much, it feels very much like my rhythm in, in ways as well of X number of years doing one thing, shifting it up and then missing certain elements and wanting to come back to other chapters, right? Let's it's talk about that a little bit because you've had such a wonderfully variegated career so far. You've worked in so many American theaters. You've worked in Asia. You've worked in um, other countries, right? I, uh, I, you know what I, I love sharing is that I directed in Cuba in 1989. Can you wow. imagine? Yeah. That was really fun. Um, what did you do there? What did you do? In so Cuba? I was part of what uh, was termed el primer taller de teatro latinoamericano, and it was the first international Latin American theater workshop. Hmm. So uh, it was collaborative creation, and we were we made street theater is in the end what we did. We, we sort of didn't have an agenda coming in. And then we discovered that there were all sorts of issues around who could enter what spaces. And so part of the answer was to do street theater. Um, so yeah. that, yeah, it was really, but two months of, of, of workshopping things in uh, outside of Havana in 1989. It was really, that was pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was pretty cool. <laughs> what did you, remind me what you won an Obie Award for. I won an OB um, it, entirely thanks to Jeffrey Hatcher because it was his adaptation of Turn of the Screw. Hmm. And and all I did was make sure I followed Jeff Hatcher's directions, right? His <laughs> stage directions are very good. Well, what's wonderful about his stage directions is that they say everything and nothing at the same time, right? So I remember one, um, she shows him the locket. There is no prop, they do not mime. Wow. Isn't yeah. that fun? Oh, it's so much fun. <laughs> and that was, you know, it was Enid Graham and Rocco Sisto. So two great actors. Yeah, I'll say. So that's that's the, I owe them all the OB because they were amazing. What theater did you do it at? Primary Stages. Yeah. Oh, I love Those that. days I was doing a lot, a lot at Primary Stages. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, we do shift homes sometimes. So I was freelancing and I was living in New York. Although when I did Turn of the Screw, actually... I was already living in Dallas and I just started teaching. So I actually just came to New York to do that production at Primary you, Stage. The Academy has been a part of your profession almost from the beginning, right? And I mean, you know who I have to thank for that in part, just because it's all about our collaborators and friends, right? Mm -hmm. A certain Mary B. Robinson, who when I got, who was Mark's associate at Hartford Stage, and who was um, the reason I knew about the Drama League because I was an intern at Actors Theatre of Louisville and Mary recommended me. I mean, I, you know, these careers, I, I think people are sometimes surprised and shouldn't be at how much they are, uh, not about who you know in terms of fame at all, but who you know in terms of relationships and friendships and, and respecting each other and recommending each other, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, right when I had when I was pregnant with my first child, I was offered a teaching job, kind of out of the blue. And Mary Robinson gave me great advice. She said, you know, try it for a couple of years because when you have a baby, it's good to, you know, you you can be almost anywhere mm -hmm. because it's really about making a home with the baby. Um, I was very lucky. I was hired at SMU and Dallas has a great airport. So uh, it was a great place to live. But so I started teaching and continued freelancing out of there. So. Mm -hmm. Teaching has been such a gift in my life because it, it it's a way of constantly growing because you can't get away with anything, right? You hear yourself say things that when they sound like bullshit to you, <laughs> you see their faces and you know they're bullshit. And <laughs> the students keep you honest in an interesting way and humble, and they teach you a lot. Well... You know, it's it's not dissimilar to being in a room with actors and designers and stage managers. Very similar. It's very similar. But, you know, what's lovely about it um, is that it is a little steadier if you're a freelancer and if you're trying to raise a family. It's it it's a very supportive. It's a much more supportive lifestyle, I yeah. think, for working parents in general or for yeah. caregivers. Right. If you have an elderly relative, there's there's something, you know, or an ill partner there's just ways that the academy can support you. You know, now the theater is starting to change, right? I mean, you and I are leading theaters at this moment of truly seismic change in our field. Mm -hmm. These ideas around, um, we see white American theater and should we not have 10 out of 12? Should we not work six day weeks? It's interesting, right? It's a conversation yeah. that I never expected to have in this country. Me neither. And I'm, I'm, I'm really loving the conversation because it's making me rethink so much about what we do, what I do, how right. I think, right. um, how I work, how I am with my colleagues. Um, yeah. And I used to, I've always said, oh, we only have 10 out of 12s because capitalism drives us to do it. Right. Because we're we're working for a bottom line. And then to see these demands sort of say, maybe you don't need 10 out of 12s. We've been looking at how when we reopen again um we expect to not have 10 out of 12s yeah we're talking about that too just to just to let everybody who's watching know and joining yeah, thank here, you. what we're what we're talking about is this document called we see you white american theater which all of us have been digesting and working through at, at the playhouse we we literally have worked through the document only part of the way so far we've been it's it's a it's a it. very it's a it's a great manifesto yeah. about how to change our field in terms of uh, more inclusivity, more justice, and actually just more decency, right? It's almost a template for, for how to create more equity in every aspect of our work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really changed us. You know, all, we've been on Zoom as a staff and with the trustees all year, and yet that document and of course the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and all of those tremendously uh, indescribable, I can't find a, I can't find an adjective incidents um, have been, we have been truly transformed and are in the process of transformation. And, and so are our trustees, as a matter of fact, have, have yeah. just taken to this whole idea that things need to change in a, in a, in a fairly radical way and change now, you know? Yeah. It's been very good. It continues to it's be hard. Great. It's hard. But I mean, speaking personally, for somebody who uh, really tries to close down a 10 out of 12 tech rehearsal around 10. Yeah, I, 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 I am of similar <laughs> inclinations. I don't think I'm so a 10 out of 12 friends. If you don't know, we walk into the theater. It's usually noon to midnight and you have a two hour break. So you're working 10 out of 12 hours. And it's just uh, you have a couple of those typically when uh, two or three, right? Depending on the size yeah. of your theater. Yeah. But but I'm with you. It depends what page you're on, right? So it gets to be 10 o'clock and you have a really complicated sequence and you go, hmm, good place to start tomorrow. We will yeah, start, right. you know. <laughs> if there's some easy cues, all right, we we, we could do a couple of, uh, of pages that aren't yeah. too hard. But if it's yeah. going to be something that requires true concentration, 
you're fried. No one can concentrate yeah. for that many hours. Well, and you're, uh, it, the 10 out of 12 rehearsals are when I think in, in, a, in a profession and an art form where you're making constant decisions, in a 10 out of 12 as a director, you're making a decision sort of every two and a half minutes. minutes. Yep. If, if not. Right. And, and decision know. fatigue is a real thing, right? It so is. you get to yeah. the end and you go, yeah, that cue's fine. And then you see it the next day and you're like, oh, oh I no, no, I don't, I don't like that. We have to change it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mm. True. I know. I know. Um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about your upbringing. It just fascinates me um, in Mexico. Yeah, it's funny as it links a little to to this yeah. moment, right? I mean, I I I think about how fortuitous it was that I worked with you. I mean, what are the odds that the production I worked on at Hartford Stage had you in it? So I got to know the artistic director as well as getting to know Emily Mann, right? I mean that. That's amazing, and that then, and then we're here. Um, in a similar way, I feel like this moment of analyzing backgrounds and identity and approaches to work, as linked to who we are and what we bring to the table, um, is is to me very moving. So I grew up in Mexico City. Um, my so I was my I have both a biological father and an adopted father. So this is part, but my adopted father who raised me and who I is my dad uh, is Mexican, Mexican Jewish, which yes, there are a lot of Jews in Mexico City. So I was raised by a North American gringa mother, also Jewish and, uh, and a Mexican father. And I attended very conservative Jewish day schools in Spanish and my day was split between half a day in Spanish, half a day in Hebrew. So I spoke English at home and Spanish and Hebrew at school and uh, always felt like a translator. Culturally, my uh, American grandparents and Mexican grandparents, uh, my Mexican grandmother was actually from Lebanon. My Mexican grandfather who I never met because he died young was from Turkey. So I grew up with a Sephardic tradition as well as an Ashkenazi tradition. So. Oh, this is like way too much, right? I'm just like going down way too. No, it's great. I love. It's it. just so. It's a, it's a very. It was a wonderful upbringing. It was a really wonderful upbringing. But you know, Hartford is 47 percent Latinx. Mm -hmm. So when this theater, you know, when I got the call, so for those of you who don't know, the, the there are search firms hired to interview us, right, Mark? That's how we. And and I was very lucky that someone told this search firm to look me up and that I began this process. So, um, but when I discovered about how dominant uh, Hispanic culture, Latinx culture was in this area, I thought, oh, I, I really want to do this. When I started in New York, my work was very much uh, for uh, bilingual work. I worked for Joe Papp's Festival Latino as a translator. Um, and I worked for Puerto Rican Traveling Theater doing plays in Spanish and in English. Um, I got to hang out with Rene Bush, thanks to Eduardo Machado. So I was doing, you know, a lot of bilingual work. And then as I entered more the mainstream of American theater, um, my translating and my directing of uh, Hispanic works is sort of quieted a bit, right? And um, and I feel like this is an amazing opportunity to bring all that together. Absolutely. In that community, too, which will. Oh, it's it. so I mean, yeah. amazing. Right. I mean, to get to add to all the classics that that you and Michael and Darko have brought to to bring in some more Spanish classics to, yes, yes, to, to bring in more contemporary Hispanic playwrights. I mean, it's really pretty cool. I'm very yeah, excited. That's great. Yeah, we just we just dipped our toes in the water when I was there with Eddie Sanchez. Um, yep. with, and um, it was it was really thanks to, you know, I mean, what's great about taking over a theater that's been run with generosity and insight is that I get to build on what you all had done previously. Right. I mean, Matthew Lopez, Eddie Sanchez, Eduardo had a play here. Right. Um, right. right. And uh, Chiara. Alegre Judes uh, won the Pulitzer for a play that was commissioned uh, by Hartford Stage. So, so there's certainly, there, there's a history, there's a legacy of that work. It's kind of more like where, where the emphasis goes in different years, don't you think? Yeah. So it's not like the work hasn't been done here. It's just kind of, can we put that a little more in the forefront 
given this moment in our history, what this city has become, yes. and what the and what I can bring from my background. I mean, when I was there, the mayor was Latinx. I can't remember his name now, but um, oh, I I think I I I know the mayor who was mayor then. He's still he's lovely. He's still a, a, an active supporter. Him and his husband are both really active supporters. Wow. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you know, speaking as somebody many generations before you in terms of- Oh, many, many, oh, theater. so many. Yeah, that's very kind. But, I mean, I feel like I, I'm so proud of how the board and the trustees have, have built on each of us. I mean, when I yes, was- Yes, I agree. Widener's reputation, who nearly found, almost founded the theater or right. you know, took it right. to a huge level. I was able to build on that. Then Michael came in and took it in a, in a great new direction that I had not been interested in focusing right. on. And then and Darko was, went this other way. I yeah. mean, it's so interesting. I do give a lot of kudos to this board and, yeah. and to a community that's open to supporting these different visions, right? Because yeah. we all admire each other so much and we're also different from each other that the board made such, and, and you can feel like how drastic each choice was from one to the other, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, but it never felt like a corrective from my right. perspective. It's an expansion. Right? Yeah, yeah, which I, I really, I really loved. Yeah. Our time is up, I hate to say. You oh, know, I could talk with you forever. An hour, you know. Yeah, well. Three minutes. <laughs> there's two martinis in person in the not too distant future. I, I, That's I, my I hope. hope we can. I really hope we can. And until then, my dear, all the best to oh. you. Thank you so much for doing this. Mark, yeah. thank you for asking me. I'm your fan. It's oh, such a pleasure to be here with you. Huge pleasure. Thank you. Mwah. Mwah. Mm.